Hello, everybody. I am Fadela Shaib, speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Friday, 11th December. Present in the room is the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Ed Kelly, Director, Integrated Health Services, Dr. Bruce Elward, Special Advisor to the DG, and uh, who leads on ACT Accelerator. Joining us remotely are Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals, uh, and Mr. Joe Kudzin, who, is, who leads the WHO Health Financing Team at WHO. Welcome all. Simultaneous interpretation is, providing, is provided in the six official UN languages plus uh, Portuguese and Hindi. Now, without further delay, I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fadila. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This week, vaccines against COVID-19 have started to be rolled out in the United Kingdom, and we expect more countries to follow. To have safe and effective vaccines against a virus that was completely unknown to us only a year ago is an astounding scientific achievement. But an ever greater achievement would be to ensure all countries enjoy the benefits of science equitably. WHO and our partners are focusing on three priorities. First, we face an immediate funding gap of 4.3 billion US dollars to procure vaccines for the most needy countries. I urge donors to fill this gap quickly so that vaccines can be secured lives can be saved, and a truly global economic recovery is accelerated. Second, we have worked hard to secure political commitment from world leaders for equitable access to vaccines, but we would like to see that commitment being translated into action. And third, we're preparing countries to deliver vaccines by assessing gaps in infrastructure. Already, almost one billion doses of three vaccine candidates have been secured as part of the COVAX facility, and 189 countries are now participating. Our COVAX partner, Gavi, is in discussions with several other manufacturers, and further deals will be announced in the near future. Simultaneously, WHO is working with Gavi and UNICEF to evaluate the first set of requests received from countries who are eligible for assistance through the COVAX facility. Addressing the financing gap is an urgent priority. On Monday, WHO and the European Commission are reconvening the Facilitation Council for the ACT Accelerator with our co-chairs, Norway and South Africa. The Council will scrutinize our strategic priorities and a draft financing framework to close the ACT Accelerator financing gap for 2021. This is crucial to ensuring all people everywhere are protected. We have all seen images of people being vaccinated against COVID-19. We want to see the same images all over the world. And that will be a true sign of solidarity. Yesterday was Human Rights Day, and tomorrow is Universal Health Coverage Day. These two days coming so close together at the end of this very difficult year are a reminder that as we rebuild from this crisis, we must do so on the foundation of human rights, including the rights to health. 2020 has reminded us that 
Hell is the most precious commodity on earth. In the face of the pandemic, many countries have offered free testing and treatment for COVID-19 and promised free vaccination for their populations. They have recognized that the ability to pay should not be the difference between sickness and health, between life and death. This year, Universal Health Coverage Day takes on even more importance than usual. Apart from the death and disease caused by the virus itself, millions of people have suffered and died as a result of disruption to essential health services. This week, WHO is launching two initiatives to support and rapidly accelerate countries' journey towards universal health coverage. The first is a global program to strengthen primary health care, better equipping countries to prevent and respond to emergencies of all kinds, from the personal crisis of a heart attack to an outbreak of a new and deadly virus. The second is a new UHC compendium designed to help countries develop the packages of services they need to meet their people's health needs. WHO is also launching a new report that provides the first analysis of how global health spending has changed during 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Many governments have responded to the pandemic with exceptional budget allocations for their health systems and even larger allocations for economic stabilization and social protection. At the same time, COVID-19 has triggered a deep global economic crisis that could have a long-lasting impact on health financing. Public revenues are declining, forcing many countries to take, to take on additional debt, which will impact lower-income countries whose economies were vulnerable before COVID-19 struck. The report warns that higher debt servicing could make it more difficult to maintain public spending on health. But this is precisely the moment for investing in health. The pandemic has demonstrated that health is not a luxury. It is the foundation of social, economic, and political stability. Indeed, today's report highlights that the COVID-19 crisis provides an opportunity for a reset in countries with weak health financing systems. It makes six key recommendations for a new health financing compact. To draw more attention to universal health coverage, we have also made it one of the main categories in the second WHO Health for All Film Festival. We're inviting all filmmakers, whether professional or amateur, to submit short films focusing on access to quality care for any health need by the 30th of January 2021. Several hundred films have already been submitted, and the two other categories for the festival are health emergencies, in which we invite short films about COVID and other humanitarian crises and better health and well-being, in which we invite films about climate change, pollution, sanitation, nutrition, gender issues, and more. We know that although children are less at risk of severe disease and death from COVID-19 than older adults, millions of children have suffered from the pandemic in other ways, including disruption to their education. According to data collected by UNESCO, classrooms for nearly one in five school children globally, or 320 million, were closed as of the 1st December, an increase of nearly 90 million in just one month. In some places, children have been out of school for nine months or more. Prolonged school closure are being presenting an unprecedented challenge to children's education, health, and well-being. Today, WHO has released a new checklist to support schools in reopening and in preparing for 
resurgences of COVID-19 and similar public health crises. It lists 38 essential actions, a new checklist to support schools in reopening and in preparing for resurgence of COVID-19 and similar public health crises. It lists, lists 38 essential actions to be considered by different stakeholders as they work together to agree school reopening plans. More than 66 million cases of COVID-19 and 1.5 million deaths have now been reported to WHO. In the past six weeks, the number of weekly deaths has increased by around 60%. Most cases and deaths are in Europe and the Americas. The festive season is a time to relax and to celebrate, but we must not relax our guard. Celebration can very quickly turn to sadness if we fail to take the right precautions. As you prepare to celebrate over the coming weeks, please, please consider your plans carefully. If you live in an area with high transmission, please take every precaution to keep yourselves and others safe. That could be the best gift you could give, the gift of health, life, love, joy, and hope. I repeat, the gift this season, the best gift this, this season you could give is the gift of health, life, love, joy, and hope. I thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I will now open the floor to questions from members of the media. I remind you that you need to raise your hand, use the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue to ask your question. Um, I think we, we will start with Laurent Siero from uh, ATS, Swiss News Agency. Laurent, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, thank you, uh, Fadela. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please, Laurent. Yeah, very good. Uh, we have observed in the recent uh, weeks uh, a trend downwards in countries like Switzerland and some of its neighboring countries. But then more recently, since one week, uh, there is a kind of uh, plateau at uh, high level uh, cases, number of cases, despite strong measures that uh, have been taken by the different governments. So how do you explain that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurent. I would like to invite Dr. Van Kerkhoff to take this question. So thank you for the question. In, uh, indeed, across many countries in Europe, we have started to see a decline in cases. Um, and there have been, and I think that's a result because of the measures that have been put in place and individuals who are adhering to those measures. But as you said, it, it's starting to plateau in some locations. And what this means is that we need to stay the course. We need to follow through. We need to continue to practice the physical distancing, staying home if being asked, teleworking, um, you know, following all the measures that, in, that are put in place to keep ourselves safe, whether these are individual level measures such as physical distancing, the wearing of masks, cleaning your hands, practicing good respiratory etiquette, um, whether you are asked to stay at home, continue to stay at home. Um, but we have to follow through. I think one of the lessons we can learn, especially across Europe, is over the summer, Europe showed us that they brought transmission under control. In many countries, cases were down to single digits, and that can and that will be done again. But we really must be vigilant, and we really must stay the course. Uh, given the holidays that are coming up, as the Director General just said, it is a time when many people want to come together. Um, but we really need to, to make very careful decisions about how we celebrate this year. Uh, we will celebrate, but maybe it means we celebrate with just our household, and maybe we, we do another type of Zoom celebration, as we will do with my family this year. Um, but uh, we do need to, to stay strong, and we do need to make sure that we keep ourselves separated from others for the time being, uh, while we have the good news of vaccines coming online. Um, but again, just to repeat, um, we need to stay the course. It's very easy for us to go up 
quickly in case incidents. It takes quite some time to actually come down the other side of the mountain that you've heard Mike say uh, in the spring. So we have to follow through. Um, but we will do it. Europe will do this again, uh, and they will, they will show us how to bring it under control. I think, Maria, you're absolutely spot on. I'll, I'll just repeat two of your words. Uh, follow through. Make sure this time that we follow through on the measures. We continue to build public health surveillance. We continue to work with communities to maintain those uh, measures around physical distance, personal hygiene, avoiding crowds, and then we add vaccines uh, gradually in the coming year, we can avoid the lockdowns. So if we, this is about us all following through on our commitments, both as individuals, as communities, and as governments in the coming months. Thank you. Um, I would like now to call on Jason Bobia from NPR to ask the next question. Jason, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, as you, you mentioned, Dr. Tedros, that the UK has now started vaccinating and the US appears to be on the verge of authorizing the Pfizer vaccine. And you, you talked about the, the need for equitable distribution. But obviously that distribution can't start in many places until the WHO authorizes a vaccine. Can you give us an update on when we can expect the WHO uh, to authorize a vaccine that can start being distributed through COVAX? Um, thank you, Jason. Uh, we have with us remotely uh, Dr. O'Brien and, and Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. Kate, do you want to start? Or uh, Dr. I Swaminathan? I don't think Kate is connected. Okay, Dr. Swaminathan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Fadela. I, yes, I can start. So <clears throat> the WHO has put out our um, um, criteria for emergency use uh, licensing. And uh, we are uh, open to receiving submissions from all manufacturers who are interested. In fact, we have received uh, several and it's a rolling submission. So as more data is uh, accumulated from the different phases of trials, it's provided to WHO so that we're up to date and, and we can uh, stay uh, as um, updated as possible. And um, we are now going to be looking at the Pfizer uh, dossier, followed by a couple of others as they, as they come in. And um, we expect that um, we work very closely with the European Medicine Agency, uh, along with some of the other national regulatory agencies. And so we expect that um, in the next couple of weeks that our committees will be reviewing the Pfizer BioNTech uh, dossier and, and coming out with an opinion. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think Dr. Elward would like to add something. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and Jason, thanks for the question. Super important. Um, as a, when we established the COVAX facility to make sure that there would be absolutely no barriers to the most rapid access to vaccines possible for all countries in the world, we're actually using a slightly different process in wherein we are indeed looking at these products through the WHO emergency use, uh, listing procedure. And at the same time, um, we have an exceptional procedure in place where some products that are approved by what we call a stringent regulatory authority can also be considered by the COVAX facility. So there will be no barrier to uh, the speed with which these products could potentially be used globally. Thank you. Uh, I would like now to call on um Isabel Sacco from EFE, the Spanish news agency. Isabel, you have the floor. Isabel. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, I had this, uh, more or less the same question as the, the previous one. Um, I would like to, um, uh, maybe to to ask again on the if um, uh, Dr. Sumia can identify the vaccines, the candidates that the WHO is reviewing, and um, if for general the general public, it, if she can explain the importance of uh, this review by WHO. Uh, taking into account that there, we all know that there are many other uh, regulatory uh, national agencies that are doing the same procedure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Dr. Swaminathan. 
Yes, thank you uh, for that question. Indeed, it's um, a bit confusing because as you rightly pointed out, national regulatory authorities do have the mandate and the jurisdiction to make these assessments and decisions for use within their own countries. So every national regulatory authority has the, uh, you know, the authority and the mandate to do that, but that's limited to their own uh, countries. Now, several countries rely on WHO's uh, pre-qualification service for vaccines and for drugs. Um, and, and that's a service that WHO provides also for global uh, procurement agencies like UNICEF and Gavi, because it's a stamp of quality, safety, efficacy, and manufacturing quality. In the case of uh, the emergency use license, of course, we base this assessment on limited amounts of data, and that's clearly laid out in the criteria. So what should be the minimum efficacy? What's the minimum safety required data that's needed? As well as, of course, all the manufacturing details uh, around the um, quality of the, of the product. So as I mentioned, we had opened the uh, expressions of interest uh, several weeks ago, I think it was about four to six weeks ago, and we have been receiving both inquiries as well as uh, submissions of dossiers from several companies. At least uh, 10 companies have uh, either expressed an interest or submitted initial dossiers. Now, the data will only be considered for an emergency use license when there is some phase three clinical trial uh, results available. And so there are only a couple of companies now that have uh, those phase three results and, and those are interim results. And so we've started with the Pfizer dossier. We expect also to have the uh, Moderna uh, followed by the AstraZeneca uh, dossiers examined in the next few weeks. And we will be coming out uh, with, uh, with the decision uh, whether it is receiving an emergency use uh, license or not. The other thing that we are doing is, of course, working with the uh, regulatory agencies, the International Coalition for Medical Regulatory Agencies, the ICMRA, with whom we have a letter of agreement now on how we would work together so that we can speed up things further. We have regulators from several countries, actually, who have uh, stepped up and volunteered to help the assessments that WHO will be performing. So these will be joint assessments done with uh, national regulatory agencies. And we have asked countries also to prepare uh, for licensing of vaccines by either accepting the WHO EUL or PQ procedures or by accepting uh, one of the stringent regulatory authorities, as Bruce was just mentioning, so that they are in a position to receive uh, vaccine doses from the COVAX facility. They have, to, they have to accept either of these. What we don't want is for every country to start an assessment process for every vaccine, because that's just going to take far too long. And so therefore it is important to rely on a few regulatory agencies uh, globally, plus uh, the WHO process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. Dr. Ed Kili would like to add something. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Fidela. And just to compliment uh, the points made by Sumia on this, one of the pieces of work certainly is the getting the vaccine through the regulatory process and getting it reviewed here at WHO. But uh, as we've always said, it's not vaccines, but vaccinations and vaccination programs that will end up uh, protecting people. And there's tons of work going on right now. In fact, the entire ACT Accelerator in many ways as the person doing a lot of the work on the health systems connector has pivoted to support the assessment in countries. Uh, we were targeting 100 countries. We've now got 105 assessments already in. And the picture of what is going on and how countries are preparing, not just on regulatory work, which does need some more work on, but also on safety monitoring systems. We've got over 65 percent of countries that have already got safety monitoring systems uh, in place. So all of that work will be uh, as important as the, the work that Sumia just mentioned. Thank you. I would like now to invite Jeremy Lange from Radio France Internationale, RFI, to ask the next question. Jeremy, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Fadila. Thank you so much. Um, a question about uh, testing. Um, a lot of people are um, thinking about getting tested ahead of Christmas. Um, in France, the health minister advised against it, saying that it might 
uh, provide a, a false uh, feeling of safety. I would like to know what is WHO, um, uh, do you have any comment on that? Do you advise against or for testing before Christmas? Thank you. Uh, we certainly advise that all patients uh, who are suspected of having COVID-19 uh, are tested um, and that we expand testing, uh, particularly the use of uh, uh, rapid diagnostic tests in specific circumstances. Uh, Maria can go into details about <clears throat> how we see the strategic expansion of testing. But we need more testing, not less. <clears throat> I think the Minister may have been re relating to the specific issue of individual risk. Finding as many infected people in the community is very important. But when you get a test and you test positive or negative on a certain day, it doesn't mean you will test negative the next day or the next day. So doing more testing to find infected people, yes, good. Relying on a single test to guide your behavior in the coming days or who you can meet or what you can do is problematic uh, because knowing your status today does not guarantee your status tomorrow. So we must sustain the behaviors of physical distancing, wearing masks, avoiding crowded spaces, ensuring we're using appropriate ventilation and doing all those things to minimize risk in those environments. That does not mean that targeted strategic testing is not a good idea. We want to see an expansion of testing, but we want to see it for, done for public health purposes. Uh, <clears throat> individuals who have the resources to have themselves tested, uh, there is nothing wrong with getting a test. Uh, it's really how you interpret that result and how that affects your behaviour and how it should or shouldn't affect your behaviour. Maria? Yeah, thanks. Just to supplement what Mike has said, we, we encourage, we advise, we recommend strategic testing. We have since the beginning. And anyone who meets the suspected case definition should be tested. Um, we've worked very hard through our regional offices and our country offices to build testing capacity. This has been a PCR-based testing capacity, and now all countries are able to test for COVID-19, test for SARS-CoV-2 infection, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, and that is really quite an incredible feat. We now have antigen-based rapid diagnostic tests that are coming online. These are cheaper, quicker, easier to use. Um, and we recommend these to be used in areas where there's a lot of virus, where there's a lot of virus circulating, um, where there are outbreaks that are happening, um, in areas potentially screening individuals at like health workers who are at a higher risk of exposure because they have direct contact with known patients. And those are really helpful to alleviate some of the pressure on the PCR-based system. But testing for testing's sake must be linked to public health action. It must be linked to isolation of cases, clinical care of cases, contact tracing, supported quarantine of those contacts. And as Mike has said, a test result gives you the result of that sample that was collected to at the time of testing. You could become infected between the time that you took that test and the time you get that result back, which is why it's really important that you not only get test tested uh, with a high quality either PCR test or an antigen based test, but that you get that result back quickly. Um, and you follow through with the public health actions that are there. So in some countries, um, testing will be expanded, um, and this is good, and we have seen a global expansion of testing. But again, it needs to be fit for purpose. It needs to be linked to cluster investigations and case finding and making sure that it, you're working towards your goal of reducing uh, transmission and you're breaking chains of transmission. Um, so there are good products that are coming online. These rapid antigen-based tests are a game changer in many ways because they can be used in lots of different settings and take the pressure off of the PCR systems. But again, uh, we still, all of us, need to adhere to all of the measures that keep ourselves safe and keep our loved ones safe. So keep up that physical distancing. Keep following all of the measures that are put in place in the local area where you live, which is based on the transmission that's happening around you. Uh, thank you. Uh, moving now to Concun in Mexico, um, I would like to invite Polina Alcazar from Oncadena News to ask the next question. Polina, do you hear me? Sí, Fadela, gracias. ¿Me escuchas? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead, please. Gracias. Buenos días. Aquí desde Cancún les saludamos. ¿Qué consideraciones se deben tomar? Ahora con un número elevado de reinfecciones, o se considera esto como un COVID largo o COVID persistente, cuando una persona vuelve a dar positivo en sus pruebas después de varios meses. Gracias. Yeah. 
So thanks for the question. There's there's two aspects to the question that you that you've asked. One is about reinfection, um, and then I think the other one is about long COVID. So there, these are two separate things, and I'll, let me just break them down very briefly. So we do know that there are some individuals who can be reinfected with this virus. Um, and this is being detected in a number of countries um, that have good lab systems that have been able to do a sequence of the first infection and a sequence of the subsequent infection, the second infection. And they can tell that there's a difference in that virus, a slight difference because the virus uh, changes. Um, and that is an indeed a subsequent infection. Um, we don't have, this is now starting to be picked up in a number of countries, um, and we have more than 69 million cases that have been reported globally, but the number of reinfections is a lot smaller than that. Um, we're working with countries to, to help them better um, define what a reinfection is and to help them look to see it, how often this is happening. Um, so it doesn't seem to be happening uh, very often, uh, but we can't quantify that at the current moment. The question around long COVID, um, is that there are individuals who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They have an acute uh, disease uh, where they're, they're very unwell or they're mildly unwell, and then they, they seem to slightly recover, but they're having longer-term effects. Um, we are learning more and more about what long COVID is in terms of the effect on the body. It seems to it, uh, affect many different organ systems. Um, it's not just a respiratory illness of two weeks. It, it seems to persist for months. Uh, we're working with many different patient groups. We're working with many different researchers to really better understand um, how what is happening. Um, we have met, and the Director General has met, um, with patient groups. Um, and the patient groups have said to us what they need is recognition that this is real and this is real. Um, and this is, there is now an ICD code um, for post-COVID syndrome, it's called. Um, they're work, we're working with them because we need better research to understand the extent of this uh, in different populations, to understand what disease looks like in terms of the long-term effects and the different effects on the organ systems, and also rehab. So we're working with clinicians um, to better design and, and work on rehabilitation uh, for individuals who are suffering from this um, to ensure that we give them the best care possible. Um, so we have a lot to learn in this area. There was a, um, a forum that was uh, organized this week by ISARC and partners, uh, which WHO participated in, um, and we have seminars and working groups um, that have been established specifically to look at this so that we can provide adequate care. And if I could just emphasize what Maria has been saying, you know, it is best that we all try to avoid this infection. Uh, it's better and not to have to be concerned about your health going forward. Also to reassure people, yes, the vast majority of people do have an infection that doesn't result in, in, in any ongoing specific effects, but there's a significant minority of people who are suffering very, very long into a post-COVID period. Uh, and our hearts uh, go out to them uh, as they approach this Christmas period, because uh, and sometimes in life, uh, mortality and death is recognized and we all sympathize. It, it's very hard when you're carrying the after effects of an illness. Uh, it can be a very lonely experience uh, and people don't want to attract attention to themselves because people may think I'm infected and I'm still coughing. So <clears throat> people are going through a lot of psychological trauma as well as having those lingering effects. So I think we should all be very kind to each other and particularly kind to those who've had to fight through very difficult infections and have the continued concern of the long-term uh, impacts on their family. And uh, to our journalist, I would say, given the weather here today in Geneva, we would love to be with you in Cancun. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> so let's go to Georgia. <laughs> I think it's called in Georgia. Uh, I would like to invite uh, um, a journalist from Georgian television, Imeda, Kitevan Kardava, to ask the next question. Um, uh, Kitevan, are good. you with us? Yeah, uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Mr. Director General. Uh, when you were talking about vaccine and about the news um, uh, about vaccine, you uh, said recently that beam appeared at the end of the tunnel. How bright is that ray today? 
can you tell us? Uh, as I represent Georgia, I want to ask you about Georgia. Uh, thousands of people are infected in my country every day. And what would you say to the population of Georgia? They are watching your statements carefully every week. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I have a question about information campaign. How should uh, information campaign about vaccination um, should be conducted so that the people have a confidence in the vaccine? We all know that uh, vaccine will be effective in uh, the case when, uh, it, uh, the, when uh, people have confidence and trust in it. Thank you very much. Thank you. These are three questions. <laughs> Um, so, uh, maybe Dr. Elward would like to start. Sure, and some of you may wish to come in on the issue around uh, the confidence and everything that's being done to build that. But in, t in terms of the comment the Director General made last week about the light at the end of the tunnel, I think was the phrase, um, and, and, and how bright is that? Well, that, that, that light is getting brighter, in fact. If you look week by week at the number of companies that are announcing positive results in terms of the efficacy of vaccines, that number is increasing. And what's important is it's increasing not just in terms of the number of products, but also the different technology platforms that they are being built on. As we've seen now, there are three different sort of technology platforms, as we'd call them, that have reported very positive efficacy, safety, uh, and safety data. Um, now, we haven't seen and scrutinized all of the data behind that, as we've emphasized multiple times. Some of this is still in press reports, but it's positive, which means that beam is looking brighter uh, to the point that you asked. But at the same time, there's other considerations, and Mike uh, emphasizes this repeatedly, and Maria, I think it's so important, and that is that there are real challenges with volumes. These are still very, very scarce products, and just as some companies are announcing successes, there are others, and we've had two or three over the, two over the last few days, that have said they've had challenges with their products, either in terms of the volumes they can produce or in terms of, uh, of some of the trial results. And so this reminds us that um, while the, the beam, as you said, or light at the end of the tunnel is getting bright over time, um, it's still a long tunnel to get out of the uh, battle against uh, COVID. And we still have a uh, long winter in front of us. And I think to the point that uh, Mike emphasizes again and again, we have to do everything and we need to continue doing everything for the foreseeable future. Because uh, with that light at the end of the tunnel, we should have a new energy now to do the case finding right, do the contact tracing right, do the isolation right. Um, so what this really should give us is the hope and the stamina to uh, be managing this disease and implementing those measures that much more strongly in the near term. Perhaps someone would like to comment to the broad agenda of work on confidence building. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ryan? <clears throat> <clears throat> no, but specific reference to, to George itself, um, <clears throat> I mean, George has had a tough time over the last uh, number of weeks. It's had a very steep rise in cases uh, and has reached a, a pretty uh, high uh, cases per million population uh, overall. Um, although that's stabilized in the last week, there's been a 9% increase in cases in the last week and I think an 8% increase in deaths. So George has had, a <clears throat> certainly in the first wave earlier in the year, Georgia managed to avoid a good deal of the, the, the impact of the first, um, uh, of the first uh, elements of this pandemic, but has been hit quite hard this time around. Uh, I think the positive uh, answers or news are that uh, the case fatality rate has been relatively low, and again, credit to frontline doctors and nurses who continue to maintain frontline services. But I think the story here, too, for, for Georgia, and, uh, it, it's something that every country needs to look at. Past success or past uh, avoidance of a given scenario does not mean that that scenario can be avoided the next time round. You may have dodged a bullet in the last time, you may get hit hard this time. Uh, and therefore it's really important that you understand uh, in a given setting. You see in situations like, uh, for example, at the moment in Korea and, and in Japan, they've been dealing with the bouncing cases in the last couple of weeks. Korea has been an extremely high performer in the area of disease control, but it's going to have to turn and fight that disease again. Uh, and each and every time there may be different risk groups, it may be a different part of the country, it may be a different age group. Each time you fight this battle, there are slightly different tactics required. And that's why you need to be agile, you need to look at what's happening in your country. You need to not make assumptions about what's going to happen 
or things are going to go away or it's going to disappear or whatever all the other euphemisms are for this. You've got to fight what you see. Knowledge and data drives that, understanding what's happening and then giving people the right information, intervening aggressively in the right places, adapting your control measures to the situation you see on the ground, expanding your testing and improving your capacity to understand clusters and amplification events, and then supporting uh, people in avoiding crowded settings and doing all of the other things we need to do. The DG keeps saying it again and again, do it all, but I would also say do it smart. And when you have limited resources, do it smart as well. Uh, and use those resources uh, and drive your public health interventions with the intelligence that comes from using science and using data, a data-driven science-driven approach. Uh, and again, uh, Georgia is turning that corner. It is not an easy time. And we've seen in Europe that as the disease has come under control in many of the Western European countries, many Central European and, and, and uh, countries in the Caucasus and even in Central Asia have continued to have a difficult time. And then that shows how this disease is in a different, uh, we're not in an epidemiologically stable situation. The virus is still working its way through the human population. The vast majority of people remain susceptible. So it has not settled down into a pattern that you can predict and say, oh, this is what's going to happen next week and the week after. That is not the case. And there are potentially unique aspects of every country's culture and behavior and setup that can drive transmission one way or the other. Maria? I'm sorry, I just want to say that it, it, it's, we're moving around from your question a little bit, but it, I just want to highlight some of the things Mike has just said there. It is about being in a state of readiness. You know, we know so much more now. We're using data to drive our actions. And if a country is having an increase in cases like we're seeing in Georgia, you still have experience. There's a lot of experience and knowledge that is being used to help tailor the approach to what needs to be done where it needs to be done and for the amount of time that it needs to be done. And that's done at a political level, it's done at a community level, it's done at an individual level. And with the example of Korea, and we could, we could choose a number of countries that have seen resurgence, it's about that state of readiness. So if you use the system that you have in place, um, the world is not in the same place we were in a year ago. Um, many countries have built up this public health infrastructure, some at a faster rate than others, but we still need to continue to invest in people in a workforce that can do active case finding, that can carry out those tests and that strategic testing so that lab results get back quicker, so that we carry out the contact tracing and the cluster investigations. This virus likes people, it needs people to transmit between, it primarily is transmitting between people in close contact with one another. If you put a lot of people together, you're in an enclosed space, you add poor ventilation, you are providing an ample opportunity for this virus to spread. We can take actions that can prevent all of that from happening. And I think that's what's really critical right now. As Bruce said, you know, the, as the, the vaccines are coming online, there's a lot of hope that we have. But I think many people will also feel a little bit frustrated because we won't be able to get to that light at the end, end of the tunnel as fast as we want to. We have to remain vigilant. And you, your question was, what should we tell the people of Georgia? Hang in there. Do everything that you can to protect yourself and to protect your loved ones. You have individual level measures that you can have. You have knowledge about where this virus is, how it spreads, and you have the power to take decisions. And each of these decisions that you take can minimize your risk. We are telling everyone, know your risk and take steps to lower that risk. Um, and, and we want people to feel empowered that there's a lot that you can do. Um, and again, as especially as we're seeing in this holiday season, please make the right decisions to keep yourself safe. While we are seeing, you know, in a many countries across Europe, a decline in cases, as, as the Director General has said, the amount of percent increase in deaths globally, as the Director General said, has been 60% increase in the last six weeks. 60% increase in deaths in the last six weeks. That is not evenly distributed around the world, where we've seen in EMRO a 10% increase, in AFRO a 50% increase, in EURO almost a 100% increase in deaths over the last six weeks. CRO 7.5%, PAHO 54%, WIPRO 15%. So it isn't evenly distributed. This virus is still circulating. Most of the world remains at risk. We can take steps to protect ourselves. Please do everything you can to protect yourself and your loved ones. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. This is a rare treat from Georgia. So uh, thank you and greetings to Georgia.
and that's the other area where we're, we're focusing. Because when we do these three things, the funding, the political commitment translated into action, and preparing the infrastructure, then the vaccines that are coming into the pipeline will lead into vaccination. And at the end of the day, the most important part of the whole process is when you see people vaccinated, when they have the inoculation, and when that is done fairly, and when that's done globally. Uh, when that's done, then the world can recover faster. And as we said it many times, sharing the vaccine and having the inoculation everywhere in all countries means faster recovery and it's in the interest of each and every country in the world. Lives and livelihoods will get back to the new uh, normal. And uh, we believe that's what the world wants now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Fidela. So very quickly on the building confidence uh, in vaccines, which was the third question. Um, it's really important that uh, governments and public health officials start communicating with uh, citizens in their countries uh, to explain to them the process of uh, the deployment of the vaccines because things are happening extremely fast and people are anxious for information. They have a lot of questions and very often it's the genuine questions that people have that, that need to be answered. They may have some fears that need to be allayed, but a lot of times it's questions and doubts which really need to be addressed. Um, and it's only a minority of people, I think, which are anti-vaccine. Um, so the surveys that have been done show that the majority of the world's people actually want a vaccine. They're waiting for a vaccine. They can't get it soon enough. And at the same time, they may have questions. So this is the time actually to explain to people who are the population groups who have been prioritized? Why have they been prioritized? When are the doses likely to come? If the fact is that we are going to have limited doses in the first half of 2021 all over the world. Doses supplies are going to be limited. We need to prioritize those who are at the highest risk of getting the infection or dying from the infection. These are our frontline workers, our healthcare workers, and the, and the very elderly who are the most susceptible. The rest of us have to be a little more patient. We have to continue with all the measures that we've talked about. And these are the things that governments need to communicate. So it's important to have a national vaccine deployment plan and a strategy. And one of the key elements of that is the communication to the public. And the more open and transparent we can be, the more likely it is that people will have the trust and the confidence and would, would not only want to take the vaccine, but would also be patient uh, and, and wait for their turn. Thank you. Just very practically on that, because uh, uh, we've been working very, very closely with the immunization program with Kate and the emergencies program on our side. We've joined together really to work with UNICEF and the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies on a common service around risk communication and community engagement, and specifically in the area of vaccination. So if countries require more integrated assistance and services and support, um, uh, there is the planning part, but then there's the implementation. So we take this deadly seriously. This is a science, and this is a moment of translating our knowledge and communications into behavior and action and demand. And it doesn't happen by itself. And it requires a dedicated and, 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 and committed investment in, in social engagement. So uh, we stand ready as three organizations and others to support member states and people and non-governmental organizations in the field in doing that. Uh, and we are specifically investing in a, in, a, in a strand of activity to support the implementation of the ACT Accelerator and the preparation of countries for successful vaccination campaigns. And uh, Kate O'Brien, Sylvie Brion, others are leading on that uh, internally here at WHO. Joe, and we have many excellent colleagues in UNICEF and Red Cross working with us on this portfolio. Thank you so much to all of you. I would like now to invite Sophie from SABC South Africa to ask the next question. Sophie, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Sophie Mkwena from the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, the topic of 
uh, vaccine on the continent uh, at times can be very controversial on the African continent because there's a perception that the continent is being used uh, for all the trials. Now, there's a, a heated debate in South Africa currently. The chief justice of the Constitutional Court yesterday, a very religious person, when he was praying, he prayed that uh, there shouldn't be a vaccine that is being manufactured based on demons. And therefore, that has generated a heated debate and it has instilled fear in some people questioning, particularly after he also pointed out that why you give people vaccine when they are not necessarily infected. If I just want to check from Dr. Ryan and perhaps Dr. Tedros, this will demand a serious discussion and perhaps a, a, a senior leaders to deal with issue of perception. What is your advice to the African continent, particularly, particularly South Africa, at the time where the numbers are currently going up? We are in the second wave of uh, the infections. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Dr. Ryan? Uh, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Edward, or Sumia may wish to come up. But if we take a step back and look at uh, from the perspective of Africa, Africa has used vaccines as one of the single most effective public health and health interventions over the last 30 years on the continent. Africa has just recently eradicated wild polio virus. It has put the wild polio virus to death on the continent using vaccination. Um, and uh, the way in which African nations, even with weaker health systems, have prioritized immunization of children, it has been the single biggest life-saving intervention on the continent. Uh, and therefore, I think Africa is to be commended for the way in which uh, immunization has been used, has been trusted by populations, and has been uh, instrumental in reducing mortality rates. When a new vaccine is introduced, there are always concerns and there are always questions. And increasingly, there are always there are people who will distribute disinformation and misinformation and anti-vaccination information. The um, dialogue is needed at community level in order to address those concerns, and we were just speaking about that, how we can deal with that. But certainly, we need leaders and others to be very consistent in their messaging to people. We need people not to be raising fears, but we need people at the same time not to be, in a sense, ignoring fears. You have to address people's fears with knowledge and with information and allow people to make up their own minds. Uh, I have great faith <clears throat> in, in people in Africa in general. It's South Africa and other countries, and again in this, uh, African countries have actually shown the way in this response. In community engagement, they've led the way in community-led responses. Uh, African countries uh, have, uh, for example, the laboratories in South Africa, in Senegal, have been reference centers for diagnostics and even the development of diagnostic tests uh, within Africa. Africa CDC and our African regional office have worked, and the African Union have taken a big leadership role. The DG may wish to, to speak to that on the continent. <clears throat> so Africa is doing well, uh, and Africans should be proud of what's being achieved. The next move of bringing in vaccines, and again, South Africa, I believe, has participated in vaccine trials and has been at the leading edge of science in other types of trials for other diseases over, over many years. Um, it, is, uh, it is really important, uh, though, that countries uh, that do support vaccine trials and countries that do participate in advancing science and innovation have fair and equitable access to the products that come from that process. Um, and uh, th that, that's another issue. The DG speaks to that process of equity. Uh, but in this, I think African nations, and in particularly South Africa, are partners in science. They're partners in the innovation. Uh, but communities have genuine questions that need to be addressed. Uh, Bruce. I may wish to speak, or Sumi, or others. But uh, again, uh, I think we need to be very rational in how we approach this discussion. Vaccination, immunization are life-saving interventions. They have saved hundreds of millions of lives on this planet. We need to maintain our standards. We need to be sure that everything is safe and efficacious. But we, we also need to, to trust in vaccination as a potentially uh, game-breaking and game-changing intervention in this pandemic. Bruce? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Mike, and thanks, Sophie. These are such important questions, and um, hardly unique to South Africa. You highlighted a couple of times specifically in the context of South Africa, but in fact, it's not just a South Africa issue. Mike alluded to this a little bit, but in every country, there are people who raise questions. But at the same time, there's no question that vaccines are one of the most powerful public health tools that we have, and certainly no population, no people would want to be disadvantaged in terms of being able to access them. That's what the entire COVAX facility, the ACT Accelerator, is all about. Um, and at the same time, um, we've got to make sure that when there are questions raised that they get listened to and that they get addressed and it's so important to create the fora for discussing these things to listen to the concerns and then to use the science and the data available to be able to answer those one of the striking things dr tedros talked about in his um, opening remarks with the speed with which um, science has created tools now and vaccines to tackle this, uh, it appears to be able to tackle this uh, uh, disease. But at the same time, as striking has been the amount of transparency and the amount of scrutiny that's been given to these products. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And I think one of the great advantages here, I'll come back to South Africa, is that in South Africa, you have such experts in the area of vaccines and vaccination, really world leaders, in fact, that whose counsel we take. And so I think the country is in a very, very strong position, like all countries, to create those fora for the discussion, to listen to the issues and to address them. But this has got to be anchored in what is now decades and decades of experience with vaccines, the power of vaccines, and the countless millions of lives that have been saved as a result of them. And that will be saved from COVID-19 as a result of these vaccines as they're proven and as they come uh, eventually to market and to use. But again, as Dr. Tedro said in his last intervention, um, a vaccine only saves lives when it's actually in someone, <laughs> not in a vial. So the big key now is making sure these products get out, uh, get scaled uh, to people as rapidly as possible. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Sophie, for those questions. And uh, I fully agree with what my colleagues said that especially with regard to some wrong perceptions of the vaccine. It's not just in Africa, but it's all over the world. Um, then when we come to the testing, especially the uh, vaccines for uh, COVID have been tested actually outside Africa more than, than in Africa. Um, having the testing as long as the uh, right protocols are uh, followed, uh, it's, it's very important. And um, that's what, we, what, what has been done. Um, and the testing, I don't think, uh, has been focused in Africa, actually. It's more, more outside. But the most important thing is whether it's, uh, it has followed the right protocols or not. It's whether it's done in Africa or, or other places. But it's done uh, in many places. Uh, then um, when vaccines are introduced, uh, whether they get the emergency use list or uh, finally pre-qualifications, the safety is central in addition to efficacy. Uh, so we follow that and other organizations, regulatory bodies also follow that. And um, we will make sure that whatever vaccine is available, uh, the two important criteria are, are met. The safety first, and then of course, the efficacy. Uh, and then the issue you raised with religion. Uh, I remember when HIV reached its climax and some uh, medicine started to uh, appear uh, and some people were saying, you know, uh, either you follow your religion uh, or you follow the medicine, the two can't go together. Uh, but, um, you know, religion and um, uh, science can go together. And I remember during that time, religious leaders themselves come out and told the public that taking the medicine and doing their religious practices actually doesn't contradict. And many uh, accepted that, and many uh, took medicines, and they saved, they saved their, their, their lives. 
So for our religious leaders, it's very important to see from um, the right authorities whether the right safety and efficacy measures based on those uh, the, um, the medicine is or the vaccine is um, uh, being provided or not. That's what, what uh, they, sh they should uh, focus on. Uh, actually, I would like to use this opportunity. It's the role of leaders, religious leaders, community leaders, political leaders, to be models and examples to convince their followers to do the right thing. And I hope our religious leaders uh, will do their best to fight the pandemics using, to fight the virus using the tools we have at hand. And when vaccines are provided, to also uh, help their followers uh, to uh, benefit uh, from, from uh, the vaccines. Uh, I thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Just uh, the DG mentioned something there, and I think it was important. I think there are vaccine trials ongoing of different types in more than 50 countries uh, around the world, and only three are in, in Africa right now. The vast majority of trials are, are occurring in South America, they're in Central America, in North America, in Europe, in East Asia, in the Western Pacific, in Southern Africa, and also I think in Kenya as well. So the vaccine testing is distributed in a world, in fact, it's a wonderful example of the absolutely global collaboration. It's the most amazing thing to look at a world map and see the number of therapeutic trials, the number of vaccine trials that are going on, and the way in which that data is being shared between the public and the private sector, the way that's, it's, that, that data has been shared between academics and WHO. So I think it's an actual sign of tremendous strength in the global system that such collaboration exists, and Africa is part of that. Thank you so much. Uh, we will take uh, a last question from China Daily. Uh, Chen, from China Daily, you have the floor. Last question. Hi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. You know, uh, this year, 2020, looks uh, quite bleak, I mean, obviously. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned about the light at the end of the tunnel. Could you give us a picture what the year, coming year 2021, will look like? Uh, you know, how much miracle this vaccine will do? Are we still going to see, get our life back or see waves, uh, new waves after waves of cases, lockdowns after lockdowns, and the travel restrictions still there? You know, what's, what's the picture in your mind? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chen. Um, Dr. Ryan. Okay. Um, I suppose uh, it's one of those moments where you say to everyone, "Let me give you to the give you, give this to you straight." Um, the situation globally is still very epidemiologically unstable. The vast majority of the world's population remains susceptible to this infection. Some countries are on a very negative tra trajectory in terms of the incidence and death rates for this disease. Uh, and most countries, even at low levels, are still at risk of a disease resurgence. It's clear, though, and what we have learned, and the hope is that many countries have demonstrated that this disease can be suppressed and controlled, and that control can be maintained at low levels. But some countries face the current challenge of intense community transmission in the context of a seasonal period when it's very difficult to separate people um, uh, adequately. Um, for those countries who are not in that situation and are achieving lower levels of transmission, avoiding intense community transmission must be an absolute objective in the coming weeks and months. Avoiding going back into situations that require lockdown. Because if that can be avoided, and when we have uh, now, uh, the vaccine coming online, it can give great hope. So our strategy is we must continue with a comprehensive approach to, to, to controlling this disease. Control, containment, suppression and mitigation together while introducing vaccine in a stepwise way. Testing needs to continue to be expanded. We need more testing, but strategic testing that tells us where the virus is. We still need more and better therapeutics. We tend to forget a little bit. We're all jumping on the, the vaccine story. But actually, dexamethasone and other drugs are saving lives. 
So we need better and new therapeutics, and that's another big piece of act <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but vaccines will make a huge difference. I'll let uh, Bruce speak to how that will and can happen. They're a massively valuable tool. But vaccines by themselves will not equal zero COVID. Um, they will have a major impact on morbidity and mortality, the, who gets sick, how sick people get, and whether they die as we vaccinate those high-risk groups. But the impact on transmission will not come until a much higher proportion of the population of a country is, uh, is vaccinated. And as I said, as the DG says, we have to continue to do it all. We have to continue to do it smart. But vaccines represent a major, major light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but uh, we have much work to do to make that a reality. I'll hand over to Bruce or others who wish to comment, and then the DG may wish to wrap up on that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I like the way Mike started when he said, I'll give it to you straight, um, because we'll go into the coming year with more hope, definitely. We're in a completely different position in terms of the knowledge of this disease, the knowledge of the enemy, and also the tools with which we'll fight the enemy. There's no question as well. But we also know that there's going to be challenges to scale up those tools, to get them out, to get them applied, and to see them make the difference we want. So you use that metaphor as well, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a long tunnel, um, to give it to you straight. It is a long tunnel. And when we look at the epidemic curves, remember now the world is used to looking at these curves. And you'll remember, they don't go up like that and come straight down, do they? They go up and then they peak and then they come down slowly and they come down over time time. Um, some of the tools will help us drive those curves down faster, but it's not going to change, boom, like that overnight. Which means, again, to the point Mike makes, Maria makes, and Dr. Dedros make repeatedly, we, this should give us hope, and with that hope, we should have a new um, energy, a new stamina to apply the measures that can make a difference. There is no reason for us to see the same epidemic next year because we know how to beat this disease, but we've got to apply the knowledge that we know in a way that we haven't uh, to the degree possible in 2020. When you look at the places that have, they've had a very different epidemic. That's what we should be looking at. Uh, thank you. I think Dr. Kelly would like to add something. Dr. Kelly, you have the floor. Yeah, just a quick thing to add to those good, two good comments. Um, you know, next year, IMF and World Bank are predicting that 3% uh, of the world economy will contract uh, and that we will have uh, millions, 30 million people who will be put into poverty. So on the eve of Universal Health Coverage Day. Next year for WHO, certainly, and for a lot of countries will be the year of trying harder. We'll have to continue on this push uh, for the response, just like Mike was saying, just like Bruce was saying, but we will also have to be continuing to work and expand this idea of what is essential, expanding access to healthcare to ensure that people have access for COVID, but also to ensure that when this is all over, we were able to say that we were able to treat those people that needed essential services as well. So that, I think, will be something that will be coming through in the next year. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Dr. Van Kerkhoff would like to add something? I'm sorry. I, I know we shouldn't all answer the same question, but it's a, it's a really great question, and I just want to talk at an individual level. And, you know, we see countries right now that have brought COVID under control, that are opening up, that have stadiums full of people who are, who are at sporting events. And I've been getting a lot of questions lately at the end of the year, you know, thinking at the year roundup of what is this going to look like? And you've heard us say before that it is completely in our hands. We have the tools now to bring this virus under control. Vaccine is an additional, and vaccination is an additional tool that we will have. But I think everyone needs to start to think about, you know, the, the patience that we will need in 2021 to get us through this, to see us through the end of this. And what is our motivation to get there? I've seen a lot of really excellent interviews lately about people saying, you know, I didn't think about this for me. I wasn't worried about me getting infected, but I was worried about my most favorite person in the world. I was worried about the person that I love most in the world, and I would do anything I could to keep them from getting infected. And I think whatever it is that motivates you to protect yourself, but even more so to protect that person that you love most in the world, do that and do it now because that's what 2021 is going to look like. That is what is going to help us <clears throat> bring this under control. And the vaccinations coming online is incredibly hopeful, but we need the patience to get us 
to that end point, and it will take some time. So we don't have that exact end date, but if you think of some of the countries that have actually brought it under control, they're almost there. They have to keep it up. They have to remain vigilant and keep it down so that it doesn't resurge, because no one, you've heard Dr. Tedros say this so often, no one is safe until everyone is safe. But find your motivation that will help keep you and your loved ones safe, because that is what 2021 means uh, to me. Dr. Tedros, uh, you have the floor for your uh, final comments. Okay, thank you. So thank you everyone for joining and see you next week in our uh, next uh, presser. Bon weekend, have a nice weekend. Uh, thank you, DG. Just reminding journalists that uh, we will be sending the uh, opening remark of Dr. Tedros